late 6th century, Mecca, Arabia. Just beside the city, on an open field, some boys have gathered in the afternoon. Soon, they started to wrestle each other to find out who is the strongest among them. After several rounds, there remained only two. The final match began. Both the boys fought with absolute resolution to win the final round. But in the end, the taller one lifted the other one on the shoulder and pushed him to the ground. Finally, there was a champion. The name of the champion was Khalid, son of Al-Walid. And the name of the boy who was defeated was Umar, son of Al-Khattab. These boys were having fun, pushing each other and laughing and giggling. They were carefree. Little did they know at that time that both of them would be immortalized in history, but for different reasons. Among them, Omar would become the ruler of almost half of the ancient world and Khalid would become the most successful military commander in human history. Such was a transformation of life in Mecca in the late 7th century that two boys from a relatively unknown corner of the world would leave their permanent footsteps not only in the history of Arabia but also in the history of mankind. But for now, as the sun sets down the horizon, the boys go back to the city unaware of the big unfolding of events that is coming towards them. Our story of Khalid ibn al-Walid begins here. Khalid's father, al-Walid, was one of the most important people in Mecca at the time. He was the leader of Bani Makhzum, one of the main sub-tribes of the Bani Quraysh. The Bani Makhzum tribe was responsible for the defense of the city and training of the Qurayshi warriors. Al-Walid was also one of the richest men of the city. His trade caravans were frequently traveling to Syria and Yemen. On top of that, he was the official poet of Bani Quraysh. This was a role of great honor at that time. So Al-Walid had it all, power, wealth, and fame. As a result, Khalid had a very comfortable and luxurious upbringing compared to other people in Mecca at that time. However, that does not mean that they did not have to participate actively in the society. It was obligatory for all the Makhzumi male to train for warfare and to learn to ride horses. From a very early age, Khalid started his military training. On top of that, he was really talented in military skills and soon become one of the finest warriors of the whole of Arabia. As he grew up, he also took part in Al-Walid's trade expeditions and thus visited different parts of Arabia. Life was very smooth for Khalid in the beginning of the 7th century. He was enjoying his family fortune and was friends with the most powerful people of Quraysh. But from the year 610, the Meccan society started to change, and the cause of that was the coming of divine revelations of the Prophet Muhammad At first, the day-to-day -day life was continuing, as if nothing had changed. But after some time, the followers of Prophet who started to identify themselves as Muslims, started to grow in number and in strength. The chiefs of different Meccan sub-tribes, including Khalid's father, Al-Walid, became fearful that this growth of Muslims under Prophet wasallam would reduce their absolute power over the Meccan society. So they started to work actively against the spreading of Islam. Soon the Muslims were being tortured, humiliated, and isolated from society. At this point, Khalid was not much bothered about the emergence of Islam. Although his father, Al-Walid, and his cousin, Amr bin Hisham, would later be known as Abu Jahl, 
led the Quraysh against the Muslims. Khalid was mostly keeping himself busy with becoming a better warrior and with trade expeditions throughout Arabia. The final match began. Both the boys fought with absolute resolution to win the final round. It was obligatory for all the Makhzumi male to train for warfare and to learn to ride horses. As he grew up, he also took part in Al-Walid's trade expeditions. Soon the Muslims were being tortured, humiliated and isolated from society. At this point, Khalid was not much bothered about the emergence of Islam. Ten years passed and the Muslims continued becoming greater in number. The opposition and cruelty of the Qurayshi elites also grew proportionately. So in 622, the Prophet وسلم, and most of the Muslims migrated to Yathrib. They established an Islamic state there and renamed the city as Medina. This posed a new challenge for the Quraysh. Medina was located along the trade route to Syria and the Muslims could easily intercept the caravans from Mecca on the way. The lifeline of the Meccan economy became vulnerable. In the year 624, a Meccan caravan led by Abu Sufyan was coming from Syria. When they got the news of Muslims, Abu Sufyan promptly sent a messenger to Mecca with this news. The caravan had 1,000 camels and goods of almost 50,000 dinars. A fortune by any estimate so the Meccan leaders could not risk losing the wealth. They quickly gathered around 1,000 fighters and marched towards the last known location of the Muslims. In the meantime, Abu Sufyan took a detour and reached Mecca safely. Khalid was on a trade expedition during that time, so he could not go with the Meccan fighters. When he reached Mecca, he got the news that the Muslims and Quraysh army had a fight in a place called Badr, where the Muslims thrashed the Quraysh forces. Seventy Qurayshi were killed as seventy were taken as prisoners. Khalid's cousin Abu Jahl had died. His own elder brother, also named Walid, was taken as prisoner. Besides, almost seventeen people from Bani Makhzum were killed. Most of them were close relatives of Khalid. This was a great personal loss for Khalid. After a couple of days, Khalid went to Medina with his brother Hisham to free their other brother Walid from the Muslims. They paid the ransom and freed their brother. On their way back to Mecca, they camped at a place called Dhul Hulayfa. The next morning, Khalid and Hisham did not find Walid in their camp. In a surprising turn of events, Walid actually left the camp during the night, returned to Medina, reported to Prophet وسلم, and accepted Islam. Khalid was dumbfounded. How could his own brother do this to his own family? They have just paid a mini fortune to release him. And on the top of that, their brother sided with the enemy who killed so many of their Makhzumi kinsmen? Little did Khalid know that during the captivity, Walid already tasted the peace and blessings of Islam. It did not make any sense to Khalid at that point, as he was unaware of the true message of Islam. Khalid and Hisham thus returned to Mecca, empty-handed. A few months after that, in 625, news reached Mecca that the next caravan was also under threat of being attacked by the Muslims. The new leader of the Quraysh, Abu Sufyan, along with other Meccan elites, decided to get rid of the Muslim threat once and for all. The plan was to raise a huge army and destroy the Muslims in Medina. As planned, 
the Meccans gathered almost 3,000 men to fight against the Muslims. Among them, 700 were heavily armored. They had 3,000 camels and 200 horses, one of the greatest military forces ever assembled in Arabia until that point in time. Khalid was given the command of 100 horsemen. His best friend and the son of Abu Jahl, Ikrima, had the other 100 horsemen under his command. As the army marched towards Medina, the only thought in Khalid's mind was to take revenge. Revenge for the death of his tribesmen, revenge for threatening the Quraysh dominance in Arabia, revenge for the humiliation in Battle of Badr. He was determined to strike the Muslims hard and also give them the taste of a humiliating defeat. The army marched on towards Medina to bring a total annihilation to the Muslims. And with that started the Battle of Uhud. Join us next time as we explore the main events of Battle of Uhud and how Khalid almost brought the Muslims to the brink of defeat. So stay tuned. When he reached Mecca, he got the news that the Muslims and Quraysh army had a fight in a place called Badr. Khalid's cousin Abu Jahl had died. His own elder brother, also named Walid, was taken as prisoner. The new leader of the Quraysh, Abu Sufyan, along with other Meccan elites, decided to get rid of the Muslim threat once and for all. Khalid was given the command of 100 horsemen. As the army marched towards Medina, the only thought in Khalid's mind was to take revenge. March 22, 625. The plain near the foot of Mount Uhud, north of Medina. 3,000 soldiers and 700 Muslims charge each other. Soon, a fierce battle ensued. Eventually, the Muslims started to push back and the Quraysh defense line cracked. They started to retreat. But one commander of Quraysh army saw an opening in the Muslim defense. He turned around and with around 100 horsemen, rushed through the opening of the Muslim line and wreaked havoc in the Muslim camp. This was the only time that the Muslims came very close to a total annihilation during a battle in the Prophet Wasallam's lifetime. And the only commander who could inflict such a blow to the Muslims was none other than Khalid ibn al-Walid. In our last episode, we saw that the Quraysh army was marching towards Medina to destroy the Muslim settlement there. The news of the marching army soon reached Medina. The total numbers of the Muslims who could fight in a battle was less than 1,000 at that time, whereas the Quraysh had almost 3,000 men marching to Medina. So an emergency council was called by the Prophet to discuss strategies about resisting the invasion by the Qurayshi army. After a round of discussions, it was decided that the Muslim army would march out of Medina and face the enemy near Uhud mountain. So, when the Quraysh army was around a day away from Medina, the Muslim army consisting of around 1,000 men started marching towards Uhud. But the following morning, the hypocrites of Medina decided to abandon the Muslims and return back to the city. After the hypocrites left, the number of the Muslim army became only around 700 against the army of 3,000 Quraysh. It was not an enough force to fight in an open plain. So Prophet Muhammad وسلم, cleverly positioned the Muslim army using the local terrain in such a way that the enemy would not be able to outflank and surround the Muslims. The Muslims took position on a higher ground, near the foothill of Uhud. 
On the right and back was the Uhud Mountain. On the other side of the defense line, there was a small hill, but no huge geographical barrier. So the Prophet wasallam ordered 50 archers to be stationed there. They were given strict instructions not to leave their post in any circumstances. This would prevent the enemy to go around the hill and attack the Muslim camp from the back. The battle started with duels fought between warriors of the two armies in which the Muslims clearly won. Then, the Quraysh army charged at the center. Amidst the fighting, Khalid made an attempt with his horsemen to go around a small hill where archers were stationed. But the archers could repel Khalid and his horsemen. The fighting continued at the foothill of Mount Uhud. The Muslim resistance was unwavering, so Khalid made another sally to surround the Muslim left wing and was pushed back by the archers again. The numerical superiority of the Qurayshi army rendered the ineffective and soon the Muslims started to push the Qurayshi fighters back. At one point, the Quraysh army started to retreat and the Muslims reached the Quraysh camp. The Muslims thought that the fighting was over and started plundering the enemy camp. But Khalid and Ikrima still had control over their horsemen. They moved their troops strategically a bit far away from their camp. Once the Muslim archers stationed on the hill saw the other Muslims were plundering the enemy camp, most of them left their position to get their booty. From far away, Khalid's piercing eyes saw this. This is the moment he had been waiting for. After the hypocrites left, the number of the Muslim army became only around 700 against the army of 3,000 Quraysh. So the Prophet wasallam ordered 50 archers to be stationed there. Amidst the fighting, Khalid made an attempt, but the archers could repel Khalid and his horsemen. At one point, the Quraysh army started to retreat, most of them left their position to get their booty. But one commander of Qurayshi army saw an opening in the Muslim defense. He led his horsemen toward the remaining Muslim archers on the hill. There were only 10 to 12 of them left there. No match for Khalid and his troops. Ikrima followed Khalid's lead and joined the fight with his troops. After the archers on the hills were neutralized, both Khalid and Ikrima went around the hill and came behind the Muslim defense line. Ikrima, with part of his troops, attacked a group of Muslims who were with the Prophet ﷺ near the hill. Khalid and the rest of Ikrima's troops rushed to the Quraysh camp to attack the Muslim soldiers there from the back. This tactical move led by Khalid created a lot of confusion and panic among the Muslims. Seeing that, Abu Sufyan took control of part of the fleeing Quraysh infantry and rushed them back into the battlefield. Now the Muslims were attacked from two sides. Although they fought bravely, they had to sustain heavy casualties. The battle was now concentrated into two separate locations. One was the main body of the Muslim fighting against the main part of the Quraysh army near the Quraysh camp. And the other was a group with the Prophet ﷺ fighting against part of Ikrima squadron. The Prophet ﷺ understood that he could not hold his position only with a few companions against Ikrima's troops. So he ordered them to slowly move towards the slope of Uhud mountain. But before they could reach the slope, Ikrima and part of the Quraysh infantry rushed from different sides and surrounded the Prophet and his companions. Here, the fighting was intensified. 
both Prophet Wasallam and his companions fought bravely and slain many enemies, but they also took heavy hits. Half of them fell in battle, and the rest of them, including the Prophet Wasallam himself, were injured. But they could eventually reach higher grounds and put up a better resistance on the steep slopes. Back in the main battlefield, the Muslims were fighting haphazard as there was no one to lead them. In the end, they lost their fighting spirit. Some took shelter in the nearby hills. Some fled the battlefield. Khalid then moved with his troops towards the Prophet Wasallam's location, but he could not overcome the Muslim resistance with his cavalry on the steel slopes of the mountain. In the end, there was a stalemate. The Quraysh army could not advance further through the mountain. The fragmented Muslims also started to regroup along the mountain slope. In the end, there was a stalemate. After several rounds of discussions debating on different factors, the Quraysh leaders understood that the more time they spend in the battlefield, the less would be their chance to defeat the Muslims completely. The Muslims were already regrouping. Also, there was a chance that more people could come to join the Muslims from Medina as time passed. Then, the Quraysh army would be attacked from both front and back, and they were unable to penetrate the Muslim defense on the mountains, even after several desperate attempts. The more they kept fighting, the more casualties the Quraysh had compared to the Muslims. So the Quraysh commanders decided to claim victory, call off the fighting, and return to Mecca. The result of the Battle of Uhud was actually a draw. Although the Muslims endured heavy losses, it was the Quraysh army who became strategically weak in the end and left the battlefield. However, in the description of the Battle of Uhud, we have the first detailed records of Khalid's boldness and his military skills. There were several other important events that took place during the battle, but they are beyond the scope of the discussion for this series. Here, we mainly focus on the general progression of the battle and the events in which Khalid was more or less involved. Therefore, in no way, this is the complete picture of the Battle of Uhud. By the end of the Battle of Uhud, both the Muslim and the Quraysh army knew that they would meet each other in the battlefield again. In the coming years, the Quraysh would make another attempt to invade Medina, which would be known as the Battle of Khandaq, or Battle of the Trench in history, followed by an attempt by the Muslims who marched inside Mecca to perform Hajj, which would result in the standoff at Hudaybiyah and a subsequent treaty. But those are stories for another day. The Abbasid Caliphate has crumbled. The vast Islamic empire that once stretched from India to Spain has now been fragmented. Spain is beyond Abbasid control. Egypt is taken over by the Fatimid dynasty, and the northern frontiers are under Seljuk control. Even part of the Levant and the Holy Land are now lost to the Christian Crusader forces. The unification of all the Muslims under one banner is now a dream long gone. But still today, we talk about this era with great interest, as one of the most important turn of events in history. The influence of this era still shapes the idea of chivalry and glory in popular culture. Films are made, books are written, comics and games are created. From children to adults, people still reminisce about those days. Even after almost 800 years, the legends of this era influence the geopolitics of the Middle East. And all these are mostly because of the work of one single man. Salahuddin, the righteous. He was the last great sultan of the Abbasid Caliphate. More than that, he was the last sultan who had a dream and dared to make it a reality. The dream of a unified Islamic force. 
the dream of reinstating the legacy and honor of the Caliphate, the dream of a free Jerusalem, free from the Crusaders. Yet Salahuddin did not have one swift victory after another, like any other great conqueror. He tried, he failed, he persisted, and learnt from his mistakes, and came back stronger. He was bold, dutiful, and intelligent, yet his reign was filled with setbacks, treachery, and disappointments. That is why Salahuddin is so beloved. He is not like a hero from ancient mythology with superpowers. Rather, he is more of a human, flesh and bone. He is a hero not because he was the chosen one, rather because he was courageous enough to be one. He chose himself to become the one. As we dive into his life in the next couple of weeks, we will see how this hero was forged in hardship and courage. In the year 1149, a young boy of ten named Yusuf ibn Ayyub was playing in the yard of his home. Suddenly, he heard a call from the minaret of the mosque. The Zengid Sultan, Nur ad-Din Zengi, has returned victorious after a decisive battle with the crusaders in Edessa. Edessa is now part of the Islamic Zengid dynasty. Hearing this news, people flood the streets in victory procession. The bravery and praise of Nur ad-Din is on everyone's tongue. Young Yusuf joins the rally as well. This event will have an everlasting effect on his young mind. Fighting the Crusaders and bringing back the lost glory of the Muslims will set the course of his life. Young Yusuf will grow up one day to be recognized as Salahuddin. At the age of 15, Salahuddin moved to Damascus with his family to complete his study. Damascus was then the capital of the Zengid dynasty, seat of Nur ad-Din. Salahuddin joined a madrasa in Damascus. We can think of a madrasa like a high school in the modern era. Salahuddin started learning about geometry, algebra, geography, as well as the Quran and other fields of Islamic study. At the same time, he was taken under the mentorship of his uncle, Asaduddin Shirku. Shirku was a general under Nur ad-Din. He was a man of solid build, a battle-hardened warrior. He lost one of his eyes in a battle and so used to wear a patch. This made him an imposing character. Under the mentorship of Shirku, Salahuddin started learning about military tactics and swordsmanship. After completing the training, Salahuddin joined Shirku's battalion and entered regular military service in the Zengid army. The time has come for Salahuddin to be of service to his childhood hero, Nur ad-Din. Meanwhile, in Egypt, a power struggle has erupted between two viziers of the Fatimid Caliphate. The Fatimids were a Shia dynasty and the Abbasids were Sunni. Sunni and Shia are the major two denominations of Islam. Historically, the two dynasties are rivals of one another. Anyway, back to Egypt. The two viziers trying to capture the de facto rule of Egypt were Sharwan and Dirgam. Sharwan was driven out of Egypt by his rival Dirgam. Sharwan asked for help from Nur ad-Din. So, in 1163, Nur ad-Din sent in an army under the command of Shirku to Egypt. Salahuddin also joined the army under his uncle's command. Salahuddin did not play any major role at this point, but the events that are about to unfold will be his first real lesson in military tactics and politics. So, we'll look into these events to understand how the stage was set for Salahuddin. With the help of Shirku's military prowess, Sharwan was reinstated as the Grand Vizier of Egypt. Shirku garrisoned his army near Cairo to support Sharwan's rule. But as time passed, the presence of a Sunni army in the heartland of the Shia dynasty started creating political friction in the Fatimid court. Sharwan was under great pressure to drive the Zengid army out of Egypt, but he himself had invited them. And without the support of this army, it would not be possible for him to hold on to power. So Sharwan started shopping for a new ally. Between the border of the Fatimid Egypt and Zengid Levant sat the kingdom of Jerusalem, a crusader state under the reign of the Amalric. Sharwan established a secret alliance with Amalric and plotted to attack the Zengid army from both sides. 
Shirku and his army were stationed in a palace called Bilbis. They were attacked by Amalric from the northeast and by Sharwan from the southwest. This betrayal put the Zengid army in a critical situation. They were not strong enough to break through the lines of the Crusades to retreat to Syria. Neither could they fall back to Cairo because of Sharwan's betrayal. Seeing no other option to save his army, Shirku sent a message to Nur ad-Din for aid. Nur ad-Din was enraged by the betrayal. He had sent his army in good faith to help his ally in Egypt. But that same ally had now plotted to destroy his army by the help of crusaders. How dare Sharwan betray Nur ad-Din's trust? Yet Nur ad-Din was a clever ruler. He did not act in haste. His main goal now was to save one of his most prominent generals and his force. He couldn't let his army be destroyed by the crusaders. If that meant not taking revenge for Sharwan's betrayal now, so be it. There would be a time later to set the balance straight. Nur ad-Din could not send reinforcement to Egypt for Shirku's aid, as that would take a long time and he was afraid that Shirku would not be able to hold off the enemy for long. So he devised a plan to deter Amalric's campaign in Egypt. Nur ad-Din assembled a strike force and attacked the country of Tripoli, not related to the current Libyan capital. The country of Tripoli was another crusader state and an ally of Amalric. So, when Nur ad-Din attacked Tripoli, Amalric had to stop his advancement in Egypt and send part of his troops back to defend Tripoli. This gave Shirku a window to move his forces back to Syria and save his army, and he took that opportunity. The Zengid army was safe for now, but Nur ad-Din and Shirku did not forget the betrayal by Sharwan. To plot with the crusaders against fellow Muslims could not go unpunished. They were waiting for the right opportunity. That opportunity came in 1168, when Amalric broke his alliance with Egypt and attacked Cairo. Amalric always had his eyes on Egypt, not only for expansion of his territory, but also for the vast riches of Egypt. The weak rule of Sharwan gave him the perfect chance to attack. Amalric assembled his naval force and sailed toward Cairo through the Nile Delta. Egypt was too weak to defend itself under Sharwan's rule. So the Fatimid Caliph, Al-Adid, begged Nur ad-Din to come and rescue Egypt. This was the moment that Nur ad-Din was waiting for. All these years of waiting and patience for the sweet taste of revenge had finally paid off. If they'd entered Egypt now as a liberating force, they would have the support of the people of Egypt to depose Sharwan. And as a bonus, they would also be able to defeat the Crusaders in yet another battle. So, the Zengids under the command of Shirku marched into Egypt. Salahuddin joined the expedition as well, this time as the commander of a battalion of the army. The Zengids and the Crusaders came face to face at a place called al Babain west of Giza, near the desert border of the Nile. The Zengids chose this location intentionally for a strategic advantage which would become obvious later during the battle. For the time being, Salahuddin took control of the right wing of the army, and Shirku took the central command. The Crusader army was greater in number and stronger in arms than the Zengids, so Shirku and Salahuddin started discussing a battle strategy to make those advantages of the Crusaders ineffective. They came up with a clever plan. Salahuddin would impersonate the central commander of the army and pretend his soldiers were the central contingent. Shirku did not station all of his troops in the battlefield and hid part of them behind the dunes in the desert. As the Crusaders did not realize the plan, they charged with full might toward the Zengid central force. This was the moment Salahuddin had been preparing for all of his military life. If he couldn't defeat the enemy with sheer strength, he would do it through strategy. As planned, Salahuddin staged a feigned retreat. He commanded his army to fall back into the desert. The crusaders chased Salahuddin and fell right into his trap. The heavy cavalry of the crusaders lost their advantage in the steep and sandy terrain. They could not move quickly whereas the lighter Zengid cavalry could move much faster on the same terrain. So the early advantage of the Crusaders was lost. Their lines broke down, and the battle was fragmented into smaller skirmishes, rather than a concentrated central attack. 
Shirku was waiting for the exact moment. He took his reserve force and returned to the offensive, and at the same time, Salahuddin turned back with his force and launched a counterattack from the other side. Stuck between the dual offenses, the Crusader army was completely crushed. This was the first sign of Salahuddin's military genius, his first taste of victory against the Crusaders. From now on, Salahuddin is no more a bystander. He now has an active role to play. The young boy, inspired by the tales of defeating the Crusaders, is now capable of defeating the Crusaders on his own. Join us next time as we explore the early years of Salahuddin's administrative and military career, how he becomes the Grand Vizier, protects Egypt from yet another Crusader attack, strengthens the nation, and eventually becomes the Sultan of Egypt. Salahuddin Part 2 Shifting Tides The main streets of Cairo. People are gathered on both sides to celebrate the victory of the Muslims against the Crusaders. The victorious Zengid army is marching toward the royal palace of the Fatimid Caliph. People are screaming with joy and showering the soldiers with flowers. At the head of the marching army is the general Shirku, and just behind him rides Salahuddin, the young hero, head held high with pride and honor. But little does he know what is about to unfold in the coming months. Once Shirku and his commanders reached the Fatimid court, the caliph, Al-Adid, greeted them with great joy and generosity. He offered Shirku the role of the Grand Vizier of Egypt. Shirku took this offer without hesitation. But he hasn't forgotten about the betrayal of Shaur. And he knew perfectly well that if he lets Shaur free, he will plot to strike back again. So Shirku's first command was to arrest Shaur and execute him. It was also a warning to everyone. Anyone who dares to side with the Crusaders will only meet one end. Death. Shirku was a man who enjoyed food and frequently arranged lavish feasts for his guests. On one such occasion, after feasting on a large meal, Shirku fell ill. The illness soon proved to be fatal. Shirku died only two months after he became the vizier. Salahuddin lost his beloved uncle and trusted mentor. Now he had to stand on his own without Shirku's support and guidance. As Salahuddin mourned the death of his uncle, Shirku, the leaders or emirs of different factions and military groups from both the Fatimid side and the Zengid side started arguing about who would be the next vizier of Egypt. The Fatimids wanted a weak vizier, so that he could not gather much political influence. Electing a strong Sunni vizier wouldn't show particular strength of the Shia Caliphate, whereas the Zengids pushed for a strong leader as the vizier, so that they can have a solid influence on the Fatimid Caliphate and its inner politics. The arguments went on for days. Then, one day, a messenger arrived at the court. He brought a letter from Nur din In that letter, Nur din recommended Salahuddin as Shirku's successor and requested Caliph al-Adid to appoint Salahuddin as the vizier. After all, Salahuddin's family had been of great service for many years to both Nur din and al-Adid. The Fatimid emirs supported this nomination as they thought Salahuddin was young and inexperienced. They thought he would easily fall in the role of vizier. On the other hand, the Zengid emirs saw Salahuddin's leadership on the battlefield and believed they could put trust in his abilities. So they agreed to the proposal as well. As a result, Salahuddin became the de facto ruler of Egypt, the Grand Vizier of the Fatimid Caliphate at the age of 30 in early 1169. Salahuddin had never had such power and independence before. But he was still in a tug of war between the Fatimid Caliphate and the Abbasid Caliphate through Nur din And as we have discussed before, these two caliphates, one Shia and the other Sunni, were never on friendly terms. So Salahuddin now had the problem of split loyalty. As the vizier, he owed his loyalty to the Fatimid Caliphate in Egypt. At the same time, as the general of Nur din he owed his loyalty to the Zengid dynasty and thereby to the Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad. This actually made it very difficult for Salahuddin to do what he wanted to do, help the people, unite the people, and free the Holy Lands from the Crusaders. Soon after his appointment as the vizier, the internal political conflict in Egypt started to weigh heavy on Salahuddin. He tried to focus his mind on rebuilding the Egyptian nation. 
he commissioned several hospitals and madrasas, which are kind of like universities by modern standards. He started investing in improving infrastructure and defense of major Egyptian cities. One evening, Salahuddin was busy in his study thinking about his plan for the nation, when there was a sudden knock on the door, followed by several loud knocks. Salahuddin ordered the person to come in. It was Ali bin Sufyan, the chief of his bodyguards. He brought grave news. Some emirs of Egypt had decided to stage a revolt and assassinate Salahuddin in the dark of the night. Salahuddin suspected that he would not have the full support of the emirs of Egypt, who did not like a Sunni vizier under the Shia Fatimid Caliphate, but he never expected that they would plot to kill him. Salahuddin was saddened. He had just started a few months ago. What had he done to deserve such treachery? But he had to control his emotions. He had to act fast before the rebels could strike first. He ordered his own bodyguards to capture the main conspirator, a high official for the Fatimid palace. He was immediately arrested and executed. Yet it was not sufficient to completely stop the rebellion. The following day, several other Fatimid emirs with almost 50,000 soldiers started a revolt in different parts of Egypt. Salahuddin now had a civil war on his hands. As the civil war continued, the number of the wounded and the corpses piled up. After several months of fighting, the rebel emirs started to fall one after another. It took Salahuddin almost six months to completely quell the uprising. No mercy was shown to the rebel leaders. They either fell in battle or were executed. It was a hard lesson for the Egyptian emirs. Never again would anyone dare to rise against Salahuddin in Egypt. Salahuddin's swift and resolute actions saved Egypt from a long and bloody civil war. And he learned his lesson well. He started to rebuild his court, appointed trustworthy family members and friends in important roles of state. Besides this, he also started appointing people based on their skills and merits and not because of their lineage and influence. This way, Salahuddin gradually created a strong and trusted inner council of his own. This solidified Salahuddin's political position in the Fatimid court. Now he could again focus on rebuilding the nation. Hardly three months had passed in peace, then disaster struck again. Towards the end of 1169, the crusader states of the Byzantine Empire joined forces and sent a massive naval fleet to invade Egypt. They were approaching fast to attack an Egyptian port city, Damietta. Salahuddin had actually been working to strengthen the fortification of different parts of Egypt since he came to power, expecting an attack from the crusaders. But he did not expect the attack to come from the Mediterranean Sea. He thought the crusaders would invade on land through the Sinai Peninsula, as they had done before. So, Salahuddin's main defense force was stationed much further south than Damietta. This meant it would take some time to send reinforcements to the port city. So, he had to find a way to delay the invasion. He sent a messenger to the governor of Damietta asking him to block the entrance from the sea, so that the naval fleets could not come inside the defensive line. He wrote to them that the reinforcements were already on their way. Simultaneously, he commanded his army to march towards Damietta. Upon receiving news from Salahuddin, the defenders in Damietta strengthened the city defense and raised an iron chain across the city's branch of the Nile. This prevented the crusader ships from entering the harbor from the sea and launching the attack. The crusaders decided to blockade the city from the sea. This is exactly what Salahuddin anticipated. He could now send supplies easily to the city through the Nile and reinforcements could reach the city from the southern side without confronting the enemy. The Crusaders realized they couldn't take the city as easily as they had thought. They began regular siege tactics and started deploying siege weapons to attack the city defense. They built catapults, siege towers, and ballistae. But the defenders of Damietta were able to defend one wave of Crusader attack after another. This was possible as they were getting regular supplies of food, arms, and men. From time to time, the defenders even went offensive to put pressure on the Crusader front lines. On one occasion, they even sent a fire ship down the river into the Byzantine fleet. As soon as it reached the fleet, the explosives stored inside the fire ship detonated, causing a huge explosion. Six Byzantine warships were completely destroyed, and several others were damaged beyond repair. On several occasions, the defenders also rallied outside of the city walls. 
attacking the siege lines and destroying the siege engines that were pounding on the city walls. After several weeks of failed attempts to capture Damietta, the Crusaders started to run out of food and other supplies. Their plan to launch a swift and surprise attack on Egypt had utterly failed. There would be no way now to continue the invasion without suffering huge casualties. The war would drain their treasury dry, and the riches that they had planned to plunder from Egypt were now out of reach. So after almost two months of laying siege on Damietta, the Crusaders decided to withdraw and leave Egypt. Although the battles at the siege of Damietta were not as intense as other invasions by the Crusaders, the failure of combined Byzantine and Crusader forces to take a single Egyptian port city was actually a heavy blow to the morale of the Crusaders. This victory proved Salahuddin's capable leadership. It would be another five years before Egypt faced another external threat. Salahuddin now had the resources and support in Egypt to continue his master plan. Join us next time as we explore further consolidation of Salahuddin's power in Egypt and his struggle to unite the Muslim nations under one banner against the Crusaders. Stay tuned. Salahuddin Part 3 The Sultan in Action Cairo, Egypt, two years since the Crusaders had to retreat from Damietta. It has been a peaceful time, and Salahuddin has used the time to strengthen Egypt. The economy improved, the army grew bigger and stronger, the defenses of major Egyptian cities were rebuilt. Salahuddin even went on the offensive against the Crusaders by sending troops to attack the border regions. Everything was going according to plan. Then suddenly, the Fatimid Caliph in Cairo fell gravely ill. As he had no designated successor, Egypt was up for grabs. After two centuries of Fatimid rule, seismic changes were about to take place. Quick action was necessary to prevent the power vacuum in Cairo from undoing all the work of Salahuddin so far. Moreover, Salahuddin was under immense political pressure from Nuruddin and the Caliph in Baghdad to establish Sunni dominance in Egypt. And Salahuddin was the second most powerful person in the country who was better suited to become the new king of Egypt. Upon the death of the last Fatimid Caliph al-Adid, Salahuddin had now the opportunity to establish his own dynasty. Thus began the Ayyubid dynasty. This was uncharted territory for Salahuddin. He'd always had big plans, but until now he did not have the complete independence and the unmatched power to work on them. Egypt belongs to Salahuddin now and he has total control of every aspect of it. And so begins Salahuddin's great leap forward. Immediately upon sitting on the throne, he proclaimed the Caliph in Baghdad as Caliph, and Egypt became part of the Abbasid Caliphate. Salahuddin would be a semi-independent ruler with the title Sultan of Egypt. Salahuddin was still theoretically under Nur ad-Din's command, and he did not want to damage that relationship. So Salahuddin arranged for a handsome annual tribute for Nur ad-Din, making sure that he had no opponents from the Muslim side to challenge his power in Egypt. Once the external support was ensured, Salahuddin focused on his own dynastic ambitions. No doubt the dream of freeing the Holy Lands was always burning inside of him, but he understood that he couldn't launch a campaign against the Crusaders unless he established a powerful empire in Egypt first. Salahuddin turned the wheel of change in Egypt. His council revised the tax codes, ensuring further revenue of the state, redistributed the lands, ensuring royalty at local leadership levels, replaced the corrupted provincial officers with skilled officers, ensuring effective administration of the state, and less chance of conspiracy against the Ayyubids. Salahuddin showed everyone that when it comes to being a sultan, he had his own way of doing things. Syria under Nur ad-Din and Egypt under Salahuddin provided a perfect opportunity to attack the Crusader state kingdom of Jerusalem from two different sides. A plan was drawn out. Both Nur ad-Din and Salahuddin started marching from their own capitals. But halfway to the battleground, Salahuddin returned to Cairo. Nur ad-Din found himself alone on the battlefield. He continued on with the assault, but ultimately the campaign was not successful. Until today, we do not know for sure why Salahuddin turned back. He wrote to Nur ad-Din about the possibility of a rebellion in Cairo in his absence, which many scholars argue was not a good enough reason. But what we know for sure is that this event caused a divide in the trust between Nur ad-Din and Salahuddin, and over time, this divide would only grow bigger. 
Although disappointed, Nur ad-Din was content with Salahuddin for the time being. He was still receiving the tribute from Egypt. However, Salahuddin's not showing up initiated a lot of rumors and conspiracy theories in the Zengid court. In general, it was seen by the Zengid emirs as Salahuddin's defiance of Nur ad-Din's command. In the meantime, Salahuddin was busy in Egypt. The steps he initially took after coming to power started bearing fruits. His army fought skirmishes in the southern and western boundaries of Egypt, launched a campaign against Yemen, and established a strong naval presence along the Red Sea coasts, thereby extending Salahuddin's control to Sudan, Mecca, Medina, and Yemen. Both his treasury and his political influence were enriched by these missions. Salahuddin won the heart and trust of the Egyptians, and people were ready to support his cause. But the more Salahuddin grew in power, the more mistrust and friction occurred between the Ayyubids and the Zengids. Eventually, the Zengid emirs were able to convince Nur ad-Din that his once deputy had now become too powerful and needed to be removed. In 1174, Nur ad-Din started preparing his army to invade Egypt, and Salahuddin began preparations to defend it. But during the preparation, Nur ad-Din suddenly fell ill and passed away after only a few days. Nur ad-Din's successor was his son, Saleh, only 11 years old. The news of Nur ad-Din's death reached Salahuddin. Undoubtedly, the death of his childhood hero and mentor had a massive impact on his state of mind. Although they were not on friendly terms at the time of his death, Salahuddin always had a great respect for Nur ad-Din for his effort to unite the Muslims of Syria against the Crusaders. Yet Salahuddin was relieved to some extent, knowing that the civil war between Syria and Egypt would now be avoided. That night, Salahuddin went to the balcony of his quarters. As he looked towards the horizon beyond the vast expanse of his capital city, all the mixed feelings and thoughts regarding Nur ad-Din's death unfolded in his mind. Not only did this impact his personal feelings, the news had also major political implications. Nur ad-Din's death changed the entire geopolitical dynamic of the region. Surely, the young son of Nur ad-Din wouldn't be able to practice the same power his father did. The power vacuum would create infighting among the Zengids. What actions should Salahuddin take now? To drive the Crusaders out of the Holy Lands, the existence of a strong Syria is essential. Without strong fronts in both Egypt and Syria, the ultimate victory against the Crusaders cannot be guaranteed. And without Nur ad-Din, Syria does not have that strength any longer. Should Salahuddin launch a campaign against the Crusaders on his own? Perhaps, but if Syria fell into the wrong hands, then the Crusaders could form a new alliance and outmatch Salahuddin's force. Should he then annex Syria first to prevent that? He could, but the values and Islamic teachings that he grew up with prevented him from doing so. He can't wage war against the family of his benefactor without any provocation. That would be hypocrisy for him, making him unsuitable to lead the armies in the Holy Lands according to his own standards of belief. Certainly, Salahuddin was an ambitious man, but his ambition was not more important to him than his principles. He knew in his heart that if he wished to be successful in freeing the Holy Lands from the Crusaders, he had to do it in an honorable way. No political backstabbing and betrayal should be allowed to tarnish his lifelong goal. As the dawn broke, and the call for prayer was announced from the minarets of the Grand Mosque of Cairo, Salahuddin could finally make up his mind. He decided to wait and not get involved in the political turmoil in Syria for the time being. His lifelong mission for the Holy Lands was put on pause. A few days later, a messenger reached Damascus with a letter from Salahuddin to as Saleh. The Sultan of Egypt had promised full support to the young prince and would always come to his aid whenever it was needed. As Salahuddin's letter reached Damascus, another message reached Salahuddin's court in Cairo. Egypt was under attack. A naval fleet of crusaders and Sicilians laid siege on Alexandria, one of the most important cities in Egypt. The attackers had almost 200 warships, 40 transport ships, and more than 1,000 knights. It was a formidable assault. But this time, Salahuddin was much more prepared than on previous occasions. Soldiers and supplies were quickly sent to Alexandria to reinforce the defenders. The initial blow was heavy on the Muslims. All the warships and commercial vessels of the Muslims at the port of Alexandria were destroyed by the Sicilian invaders. But as the reinforcements reached the city, the defenders' morale was boosted. 
On the second day of the battle, when the invaders brought their siege towers near the wall of Alexandria, the Muslim defenders burst out of the gates in a surprise attack and did their best to hit the enemy's morale. They burnt down the siege towers, ravaged the enemy camps, and took away large amounts of weaponry and treasure. This was a serious blow to the invaders. As the siege dragged on for days, the invaders started to lose strength. They needed reinforcement, but the promised reinforcements never arrived from the Crusader states. That was because King Amalric died suddenly of dysentery in Jerusalem. His kingdom was passed on to his 13-year-old son, Baldwin IV, who was suffering from leprosy. This sudden death of Amalric prevented the Crusaders from sending the promised supplies to the battlefield. Ever the diplomat, Salahuddin quickly initiated a truce between him and the new Crusader king, leaving the Sicilians alone to fight in the battle. Simultaneously, Salahuddin started marching towards Alexandria with a huge army. The Sicilians had to accept the defeat. What could have been the biggest threat to Salahuddin's reign actually brought yet another victory through his military and diplomatic prowess. But all the news was not good. Back in Syria, the young prince Asale became a pawn in the fighting among top Zengid leaders. The prince was in Aleppo, and the emir of Aleppo Gamushtigin wanted to use his guardianship over the prince to establish his own political influence in Syria and kill the other emirs in the region, starting with Damascus. A political rival of the emir of Aleppo was Saif al-Din, the emir of Mosul. But he refused to come to the aid of Damascus when requested. So seeing no other way, the emir of Damascus had to ask support from Salahuddin. This request gave Salahuddin the legitimacy to get involved in the power struggle in Syria. But Salahuddin had to act quickly. There was no time to assemble a large army and spend several weeks marching towards Syria. He took 700 of his best horsemen and rushed towards Damascus. To save time, he even went through crusader territories Karak and Shubak. Although a very risky maneuver, it proved fruitful. Salahuddin traveled so quickly through the enemy territory that the crusaders could not do anything about it. In the end, Salahuddin reached Damascus even before Gamushtigin's army started marching on the city. This was a brilliant move by Salahuddin, as Damascus now came under his control without any serious resistance. It saved plenty of time, resources, and bloodshed. The people of Damascus welcomed Salahuddin with open arms as their protector. After establishing his base in Damascus over the next few days and gathering more local force, Salahuddin quickly moved towards Aleppo, laid siege on the city, and demanded the guardianship of the prince Assale. One dark night during the siege of Aleppo, while Salahuddin was discussing plans with his emirs in a private tent, someone rushed into the tent from the darkness. He was dressed in black and had a bare knife at his hand. He jumped onto Salahuddin in an attempt to stab him with the knife. This was Salahuddin's first encounter with the secret cult called the Assassins. So far, we have seen Salahuddin rise in power and win one victory after another. As we further explore the events of his life, we'll see a new chapter unfold, a chapter full of struggles, stalemates, and challenges, a period in which Salahuddin spends most of his time and effort fighting his fellow Muslims rather than the Crusaders. Salahuddin Part 4 Pitfalls in Syria Aleppo, Syria, 1175 As the morning sun rose, Salahuddin looked at the walled city of Aleppo from a nearby hill. The attack by the assassins on his life the night before had left him perplexed. He had underestimated the shrewdness of Gumushtigin. Salahuddin could not imagine that Gumushtigin would hire assassins to kill him. The assassins were a secret group fortifying themselves in the dense mountains of Syria, and they were famous for targeted killings of political personnel of high power in both the Muslim and Crusader ranks. Ideologically, they followed the Shia sect, and thus they did not like Salahuddin for abolishing the Fatimid Caliphate. So it was very easy for Gumushtigin to convince the assassin's leader, Rashid ad-Din Sinan, to attack Salahuddin. On top of that, more news had recently come to Salahuddin that the Crusaders, under the command of Raymond of Tripoli, were gathering forces and raiding the borders of Salahuddin's Syrian territory. It was rumored that Gumushtigin had a hand in that as well. 
all the pieces of the puzzle were now falling into place. Salahuddin could see how treacherous Gumushtigin had been. He looked at the citadel of Aleppo. He realized how far away he was from gaining total control of Syria. The capture of Aleppo seemed like a dream now far away. Salahuddin had to respond immediately against the threat of the Crusaders. He couldn't risk his life and the loss of his army to continue the siege on a heavily fortified city like Aleppo. In this round, Gumushtigin had won. Salahuddin lifted the siege and took his army back to Damascus. From there, he sent forces to deter the raiding crusaders. Salahuddin's recent momentum in Syria caused a lot of jealousy in the Zengid leadership. The emerging leader of the Zengids, Saif al-Din, was a cousin of Nur al-Din. So, he got the support of Prince As-Saleh and Gumushtigin. Saif al-Din soon united the quarreling Zengid emirs and solidified his position on a vast territory including Mosul and Aleppo. To weaken the position of Salahuddin in Syria, they launched a massive propaganda campaign stating that Salahuddin had forgotten his responsibility of freeing Jerusalem from the Crusaders. Salahuddin's reputation in Syria as a warrior of the Holy War was heavily damaged because of this. Salahuddin was under heavy pressure to take action, but his army was not yet strong enough to recapture Jerusalem, so he devised another plan. Salahuddin strengthened his forces in the cities of Horns and Hama in Syria, and from there he could launch skirmishes in the border territories of the Crusader states. These skirmishes were quite successful and in many cases drove Crusaders to withdraw. These victories worked as a checkmate for Salahuddin against the Zengid propaganda. Salahuddin's popularity soared among the Syrians as never before. In the following weeks, the political and territorial conflict between the Zengids and Ayyubids became so intensified that there was no way to avoid war. The armies met near Hama in March of 1175. Salahuddin was vastly outnumbered and had no intention of fighting his fellow Muslims. So Salahuddin proposed handing over Homs and Hama to the Zengids and in return asked acknowledgement as the ruler of Damascus on behalf of Princess Saleh. But the Zengids, led by Saif al-Din, were unmoved. Their reply was, surrender all lands in Syria and return to Egypt. The negotiation failed and the confrontation was unavoidable. Salahuddin's military skills and experiences had been greatly boosted by his recent military campaigns. This was reflected in how he arranged his forces to face the stronger opponent. He placed his army at the horns of Hama, hills by the gorge of the Orontes River. As soon as the Zengids attacked, they found themselves fighting the battle uphill and pinned by the river at one side. The Zengids' numerical advantage was nullified. Salahuddin launched a strong counterattack with his most veteran soldiers, immediately collapsing one wing of the Zengid army. Another wing followed shortly thereafter. The Zengids were surrounded from three sides and were thrashed. Another victory for Salahuddin. Through tactics and determination, Salahuddin would now be able to force the Zengids into a truce. The Zengids conceded that Salahuddin should keep his territories in Syria. But the prince would still be in Aleppo under Saif al-Din's guardianship. Finally, peace among the Muslims in Syria had begun. The victory against the Zengids was a crucial development in Salahuddin's political career. After the victory, Salahuddin was acknowledged by the Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad as Sultan of Egypt and Syria. And as sovereign king, he no longer needed the patronage of the Zengid prince. Both in Cairo and in Damascus, coins were being minted with his official titles, and the Friday prayer sermon in the mosques, or kutbas, started mentioning him as the sole ruler omitting the name of a Saleh. This was a decisive move. Officially, Salahuddin was no longer a part of the Zengid dynasty. But his good fortune didn't last long. During the summer of 1175, a bad drought 
made the continuation of fighting with the Crusaders an impossibility. The Crusaders were also hit by the same situation, so they made peace with Salahuddin and there was a pause on ongoing conflicts. Salahuddin could take a break from military campaigns and focus on the administration of his vast empire that included Egypt, Yemen, Hejaj consisting of Mecca and Medina, and Syria. Hardly a year had passed, political turmoil returned in Syria. Saif al-Din started looking for trouble in order to fight Salahuddin and to gain his territories. So Salahuddin gathered his forces and marched northwards from Damascus towards Aleppo. On the way, in a place called Tel al-Sultan, he encountered the army of Saif al-Din. Salahuddin's army was exhausted by their march, but the general lack of leadership and military skills amongst the Zengid leaders caused a delay in initiating the fight. This gave the Ayyubid army an unexpected opportunity to rest and regain their strength. When the fighting finally began the following day, battle-hardened Salahuddin took full advantage of the incompetence of the Zengid leaders. As soon as the wings of both armies met one another, Salahuddin charged forward at the center. The Zengid soldiers became panicked by this surprising maneuver and failed to keep their formation. The Zengids were decimated and Saif al-Din narrowly escaped. The whole Zengid war camp, including horses, armors, arms, and baggage trains, were captured by the Ayyubids. All the captured riches were distributed among the soldiers. Salahuddin kept nothing for himself a custom that Salahuddin followed in every battle of his life. Saif al-Din fled to Aleppo. After the battle, Salahuddin moved north, capturing more towns in northern Syria from the Zengid command. Eventually, he reached Aleppo region and laid siege to the castle of Azaz, a formidable and strategically important site. One night during the siege, Salahuddin was having a discussion with his emirs inside his tent. A man dressed in black suddenly entered the tent and stabbed Salahuddin in the head with a knife. Fortunately, Salahuddin had been wearing a chainmail hood under his turban, and the first blow slipped and only cut his cheek. Salahuddin grabbed the man's knife hand and started to twist. The assassin tried to strike again at Salahuddin's neck. The strength and resistance of Salahuddin were enough to stop the assassin from landing a lethal blow. Still, the attacker's knife was able to cut through the leather armor on Salahuddin's shoulder and inflicted a wound. By this time, the emirs in the tent had fully realized what was going on and came forward to rescue their sultan. The assassin was struck down by them. While all of this was going on, a second and third assassin rushed into the tent and started attacking the emirs. But the chaos and screaming had alerted the guards. They came running and killed the assassins. Salahuddin's wounds were not severe, but he was profoundly shaken. He realized how serious of a threat the assassins had become. He immediately took precautions and raised guards around the camp to prevent any intruders from entering unnoticed. After a month of siege, the castle of Azaz fell. Now Aleppo was completely surrounded. Salahuddin didn't want to launch a full-fledged attack and destroy the city. This would cause a lot of bloodshed on both sides, and Salahuddin didn't think it would be wise to prolong the campaign against his fellow Muslims unnecessarily. So when the Zengids in Aleppo offered a truce and proposed more territorial control to Salahuddin, he accepted their offer. The whole of northern Syria came under the Ayyubid dynasty except Aleppo. Now came time to settle scores with the assassins. Salahuddin launched a campaign into the territories occupied by the assassins. Soon, he reached the castle of Masyaf, which belonged to the assassins' leader himself, Rashid ad-Din Sinan. Salahuddin laid siege to the castle. Day after day, Salahuddin sent his army to occupy the castle. Every time, the assassins resisted fiercely. The siege became long and bloody. But Salahuddin was relentless, wanting to see the end of it. So the fight continued. Finally, the assassins gave up and offered to make peace. Salahuddin now had two choices. He could either accept the peace or could continue the siege. The castle of Masyaf was a tough defensive site, fortified with walls and towers placed on top of a mountain. 
Continuing the capture of the castle would mean that Salah ad-Din would have to accept great losses and significantly weaken his army. This would give the Crusaders and the Zangids opportunities to make moves against him. After considering these factors, Salah ad-Din took the wiser route. He accepted the truce. A treaty was signed. Rashid ad-Din Sinan promised not to attack Salah ad-Din ever again and swore his allegiance. Although the assassins were not completely wiped out, Salah ad-Din still could neutralize the threat of the assassins. Salah ad-Din could turn an enemy into a strength, one less enemy to worry about. Finally, the situation in Syria was stable. The Zengids were no longer a threat. The assassins were under control, and the Crusaders had stopped their raids. Salah ad-Din now had a brief period of peace he could finally focus on preparing for his ultimate goal, Jerusalem. He returned to Cairo focused on fortification of his territories on different fronts, reorganized his army, and started planning a full-on offensive against the Crusaders to win back Jerusalem. After years of political struggle and bloodshed with his fellow Muslims, Salah ad-Din thought now he would be able to achieve his ultimate goal. Little did he know that he would soon have to flee the battlefield narrowly, escaping death. This was Salah ad-Din's first major campaign against the Crusaders, and it resulted in the most devastating defeat of his life at the Battle of Montgisard. Salah ad-Din Part 5 In Failure, He Learned to Succeed The 26th November 1177 as the sun rose in the desert of the Sinai Peninsula, a small group of horsemen were moving at lightning speed towards Cairo. This group of horsemen consisted of Salah ad-Din and a handful of his bodyguards. Salah ad-Din himself rode in the middle of the group, his mind clouded with fury and embarrassment. He was thinking about the defeat he had endured just the afternoon before. He'd had all the advantages, and yet his mission failed. How could that be? How could he lose to the Crusaders? To understand Salah ad-Din's defeat at the Battle of Montgisard, we have to look a few weeks beforehand. When Salah ad-Din launched his campaign in early November of 1177, he had 18,000 soldiers plus 8,000 elite Mamluks. The Mamluks were highly trained, most skilled, and were the most enduring units of Salah ad-Din's army. They can be compared to the knights in European armies of the 12th century. Salah ad-Din's army was strong enough to face any army that the Crusader states could muster. Upon entering the Crusader territory, his army started raiding with the aim to cut the food supply to different Crusader strongholds. Salah ad-Din quickly passed the Crusader fortresses at Tarum and Gaza. He left a small garrison at each of these fortresses but did not engage in battle. Soon, the army reached Ascalon, a heavily fortified and strategically important Crusader city. Here, Salah ad-Din camped his main forces and sent some troops around to raid even deeper into the Crusader heartland to create panic and fear. However, he didn't lay siege on the city itself. It's a rare instance when Salah ad-Din left enemy strongholds unattacked behind his front line. First Daruma and Gaza, then later Ascalon. This would prove to be a costly mistake by Salah ad-Din in the coming days. Initially, Salah ad-Din's soldiers faced little to no resistance in their advancement. Some troops even reached Ramla, around 40 kilometers from Jerusalem. It seemed just a matter of time before Salah ad-Din would appear at the gates of Jerusalem with his army. This advancement by Salah ad-Din's army caused great panic among the Crusaders. King Baldwin IV called for every able man in his kingdom to bear arms and join the battle. Although suffering from leprosy, his health was stable enough for him to ride with his army to the battle. Answering his call, princes from the different crusading states joined his army. Among them was Reynald of Chatillon, Prince of Karak, a name we would see returning frequently in future events. Now back to Baldwin IV's battle plan. He had to prove to his subjects that he was a capable king who would face the attackers and not simply let his kingdom be taken away. He decided not to wait until Salah ad-Din reached Jerusalem, rather to ride out and take the battle to Ascalon. This was a bold decision considering he only had 7,000 men to face off against Salah ad-Din's 26,000. But he had to reach Ascalon with his army avoiding Salah ad-Din's raiding troops. If discovered before reaching Ascalon, he would not be able to defend his army. 
In an unfortunate turn of events, the scouts sent by Baldwin found that the Muslim troops spread out too thin to create a solid blockade at Ascalon. The groups were so far apart from each other that they would not be able to reassemble without significant delay. Seeing such gaps and a lack of discipline, the Crusaders took the opportunity and moved towards Ascalon through the gaps of the Muslim encirclement. Although late, the news reached Salahuddin before Baldwin IV's arrival in Ascalon. Yet, surprisingly, he decided not to engage this time as well. We cannot know for sure what was going on in Salahuddin's mind. Perhaps he thought he could pin down Baldwin in Ascalon without spending the strength of his army and this way making it easier to capture Jerusalem without the king present. But before Salahuddin could put his plan into action, Baldwin IV surprised Salahuddin. On the afternoon of the 25th of November, 1177, Baldwin IV, with around 375 knights, heavily protected under metal armors and with strong horses, attacked Salahuddin's central camp near Ascalon. The rest of the army followed and smashed against the Muslim front line. Salahuddin realized the threat too late. Although he had sent orders to his scattered troops to gather, they could not reorganize quickly enough to put up a resistance. Salahuddin stepped back and tried to pull his forces on top of a hill called Monjisar. But the powerful charge by the Crusaders did its trick and Salahuddin's lines were broken. Salahuddin tried to rally his troops two times to counter the attack, but both attempts failed. The soldiers started to flee. The Crusader knights reached so close to Salahuddin that there were only a few elite Mamluk guards to protect the Sultan. By Salahuddin's own description of the events, a Templar knight came so close to him that he tried to hit Salahuddin on the chest with a lance. Luckily, three of Salahuddin's bodyguards were close enough and could come to his aid before the Sultan was injured. Salahuddin had to retreat. The whole Muslim camp, even Salahuddin's personal tent, was lost. Although Salahuddin could retreat safely, his army could not. Only a part of his force fought at Montisard and were thrashed by the Crusaders. The other groups, who were spread out too far and were also attacked from all sides later on. Even while retreating, the fortresses that were left unattacked behind the front line became a constant source of attack and harassment for his soldiers. The defeat at Montisard was a serious setback for Salahuddin's plan. No doubt, he was sad and embarrassed, but the political consequences far outweighed any emotional damage. Salahuddin was now incredibly vulnerable. His kingdom was exposed both to the Crusaders and to his competitors in Syria. The morale of the Muslims was at the lowest it had been in decades. Meanwhile, the Crusaders were having victory parades showing off the spoils of battle. Salahuddin safely reached Cairo and from there he started reorganizing. Now what we know about Salahuddin is that he was no quitter. He had surely learned many hard lessons in the aftermath of the Battle of Montgisard and our guy Salahuddin was someone who learns from his mistakes. The next time, Salahuddin would be prepared for surprises. How much Salahuddin evolved as a leader after this event was obvious in the events that unfolded in the following months. The Crusaders, boosted in morale with their victory, launched attacks at strategically important cities in Syria such as Hama and Damascus. Some of the emirs in Syria also rebelled against Salahuddin, seeing his recent defeat. But Salahuddin was prudent and swift in his damage control. He soon moved back to Syria and from there coordinated his forces on multiple fronts. The rebellion was swiftly taken under control, although not completely quelled. Then there was a decisive victory of Salahuddin's forces in Hama that stopped the Crusader incursion. Salahuddin himself camped near Homs and engaged in skirmishes with the Crusaders. Salahuddin emerged victorious from these skirmishes and stalled the Crusaders from advancing. But Baldwin IV still did not give up. In an attempt to create pressure, he started building a castle at a place called Jacob's Ford. It was a real threat to the Muslims because of the location of the castle. Situated only 80 kilometers from Damascus, an army from Jacob's Ford could reach Damascus within a couple of days. It was also along the pilgrimage route, so the Crusaders could attack caravans making their way to Mecca for Hajj. Salahuddin decided to resolve this issue once and for all. He sent one of his generals, Baruch Shah, to defend Damascus. While Baldwin IV advanced with his army towards Damascus, he expected almost no resistance. Instead, he met a formidable Muslim army and had to retreat after a humiliating defeat. Salahuddin regained his confidence and the trust of the Muslims. These victories were essential for Salahuddin at this crucial point. He could recover much of the military strength that was lost at the Battle of Montgisar. The morale of the Muslims was high again. He brought reinforcement from Egypt and completely pushed the Crusaders out of Syria. 
Salahuddin might have lost a battle, but he was still very much capable of fighting and winning the war. Salahuddin offered 100,000 pieces of gold to Baldwin IV to abandon the castle at Jacob's Ford, stating it would save lots of bloodshed on both sides. But his offer was refused. This was a clear provocation by the Crusaders. So Salahuddin launched a campaign again into the Northern Crusader territories in 1179. This would be the first campaign that Salahuddin led himself since the Battle of Montgisard, almost 18 months prior. The Crusaders had to divide their forces from Jacob's Ford to answer Salahuddin's offense. This was his plan, to split the Crusader army, and it worked. The two armies met in a series of battles near Banyas, Sidon, and Beirut, which are part of modern-day Lebanon. This time, Salahuddin prevailed, and his army wiped out the Crusaders. These victories ensured bountiful food supply and riches for Salahuddin's troops, while the Crusader army was significantly weakened. A number of high-ranked Crusader knights were captured and taken prisoner. With a brilliant move, Salahuddin then decided to attack the Crusaders stationed at Jacob's Ford immediately. This surprise move by Salahuddin turned the battle into a race against time. It would take five to six days for reinforcements to arrive from Jerusalem to Jacob's Ford, so Salahuddin had to capture the castle within five days to avoid a long and devastating siege. So the Muslims attacked the castle with their full might. Day 1. The outer defensive works were captured by the Muslims, but the four-meter-thick main wall of the castle still held them back. Day 2. The wall was bombarded with siege weapons for hours. The wall still stood high. In a desperate attempt, the Muslims tried to overrun the wall with ladders, but they failed. Salahuddin became even more desperate. He commanded his men to start digging a tunnel to go underneath the wall. The idea was to put explosives underneath the wall and blow the whole thing up from underground. Day 3. The attacks continued, but the wall stood strong. Meanwhile, the digging of the tunnel continued. Day 4. The tunnel was finally done. The order was given to set the explosives. The Muslims waited in anticipation for the explosion and the subsequent collapse of the wall. But that moment never came. The wall stood firm, meaning the tunnel did not reach close enough underneath the wall. Day 5. The Crusader reinforcement was only a day away. It was now or never. In a desperate attempt, the Muslims ran with buckets of water to put out the fires in the tunnel and dig further underground. The tunnel continued, but would it be finished in time? Day 6. As the sun rays peeked out across the horizon, Muslim soldiers put the explosives at the end of the newly dug tunnel and started the fire. Only a few hours were left before the Crusader reinforcements would arrive. Suddenly, there was a cracking sound, and then came a huge explosion. To the cheers of the Muslims, the stones of the wall shuddered, and the wall collapsed downwards. Finally, a breakthrough. A gap. The Muslims charged forward. The Crusaders gathered around the gap to create a choking point for the Muslims. From behind the infantry, the Muslim archers rained armor-piercing arrows down on the Crusaders. Desperate hand-to-hand -hand combat ensued amidst the rubble and dark clouds of smoke. Inch by inch, the Muslims pushed in. The order was to show no mercy and take no prisoners. The Crusader reinforcement arrived nearby, but seeing the column of smoke from the distance, they lost hope and turned around. The Muslims dealt one final push, and finally, the castle was under Muslim control. Salahuddin's yellow standard was finally flying over the tower of Jacob's Ford. In the following month, Salahuddin showed an even broader strategic approach against the Crusaders. He had been working on rebuilding the Egyptian naval force for the last few months, and to show his strength, he launched a naval assault in another important Crusader city named Acre just weeks after recapturing Jacob's Ford. Although being a shot and run mission, it successfully destroyed the harbor towers and several ships. After decades, Muslims now had a formidable navy. Salahuddin once again showed how he had learned and improved from every setback in his life. The game had now turned. The Crusaders had lost the upper hand. Salahuddin now dominated the borders of the Crusader states, both from land and sea. But with all the fighting continuing on the Western Front, a great storm was brewing elsewhere, moving fast to engulf Salahuddin's empire. The political turmoil returned to Syria and Reynald of Chatillon decided to attack Medina and kidnap the body of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in an act of revenge.